Saturn. Okay. okay, friends, we start now um, another topic which is there uh, on contact diseases, which is tetanus. And um, tetanus is a, a deadly disease which has been uh, creating problems for our country since a long time. And um, again, tetanus is transmitted mainly because of the fact that we either do not keep our wounds clean or we do not have proper or clean delivery facilities. And that is the reason why tetanus was so rampant in our country. We used to have a large number of cases of tetanus, uh, especially tetanus neonatorum. And uh, this was mainly because of poor delivery uh, facilities which were there in the villages. And uh, there was also this particular uh, trait which was there in the Indian, the custom which was there, that once the umbilicus was cut, a uh, cow dung was placed onto the umbilical cord. And that resulted in the transmission of tetanus to the child. So tetanus neonatorum was very well known until we started a strong campaign against uh, health, uh, health education campaign against tet tetanus and we have managed to eliminate uh, tetanus neonatorum from this country in 2015. Please remember the word elimination not eradication, El elimination. Elimination is when we, we decrease the amount of disease in the population so that it does not remain a public health problem. So tetanus neonatorum today is considered to be not a public health problem, a large public health problem in our country. Let's see what we have to say further. So tetanus is an acute disease induced by an exotoxin of Clostridium tetani and clinically characterized by muscle rigidity which persists throughout the illness, punctuated by painful paroxysmal spasms of voluntary muscles. Now, before I go any further, please think it over. You are looking at a disease which has got muscular rigidity with spasms. Can you think of any other disease which also causes this, these problems? Well, there are two which come to mind very rapidly. One is rabies and second is botulism. So these two diseases one has to keep in mind. Throughout my lecture now, please look at uh, the rigidity and the spasms which are there in tetanus, how they correlate with botulism and with Rabies. We'll discuss this in, as you go by. So, tet is the word tetanus is, um, comes from tetanos, which means stretch. And um, it causes opisthotonus, as you are aware. Opisthotonus is arching of the spine, which is a rigid spine, which is there. Opisthotonus. Opistho meaning behind. That means the spine moves behind. Okay. So first described by Hippocrates and Ariatus, and um, the etiology was discovered in 1884 by Carle and Ratone, and the disease was, um, at that time was transmitted to rabbits. 1884, there is a history of uh, which we can run through. 1884, Nicolaire uh, suggested that tetanus is due to strychnine, because strychnine also gives a similar type of uh, the rigidity which is there, strychnine like poisoning of bacillus. 1886, the Rosenbach uh, demonstrated the bacillus in tetanus case. While well, 1889, Kitasto isolated the pure culture and reproduced the disease in animals. Passive immunity, you see, uh, all these diseases are transmitted, I mean, tetanus is mainly transmitted through wounds. So, we are, uh, when we look at World War I and World War II, you would have had a large number of cases of 
tetanus and passive immunity was started during uh, for as prophylaxis was started in world war 1 while by world war 2 you had got the active immunity the you had got the tetanus toxide already ready so two types of uh, prophylaxis which were there to be taken one passive immunity which was there in world war 1 and world war 2 you had the active immunity come on. So, <clears throat> occurrence of this disease is worldwide but common in regions which have got hot, damp climates with soil rich in organic matter. We in our country, we used to use a large amount of cow dung etc. In our, in, in, during farming. So, and we do have hot, damp climate. So, that's how we had a large number of tetanus cases. Comparatively rare in developed countries where you do not use organic matter for uh, farming, you also do not uh, have hot climate, you have got a much more temperate climate over there. Neonatal tetanus is also very dangerous because it is the second most common disease after measles among the six, six, the, the six diseases described in the uh, EPI. So, what is EPI? Expanded Program of Immunization. So, Case fatality is 80 to 90 percent even after treatment. Here you have got disease which is causing rigidity, which is causing sarsem with 80 to 90 percent uh, case fatality. You have another disease which causes uh, similar problems, which causes 100 percent mortality that is rabies. Okay. So both these diseases are very, very serious. We, we may, I don't know whether I'll take rabies, but somebody will take rabies. Oh. It occurs in areas of poor health care and hence remains highly underreported. Underreporting is a feature for all diseases in our country. If you start looking at today's COVID figures, you'll start, you'll be alarmed to see that there are huge number of cases in Maharashtra and uh, very few cases in UP. Is it that UP is doing very well? Not necessarily, not necessarily. The reason is because Maharashtra has got an excellent system of reporting of cases always had. It's a very good um, IDSP system which is there. Integrated, integrated Disease Surveillance Project. Please program. You please read up IDSP. If it has already been taught to you. So please read it up. IDSP is very important. So the reporting system in Maharashtra is very good. While reporting system in UP is very poor. So we do not know whether COVID is really controlled in UP or not, but uh, the figures which are there in Maharashtra are, are, appear to be the real figures. Okay, coming back to uh, tetanus. Tetanus, when you start looking at tetanus in 1988, we had 2,90,000 deaths, while uh, neonatal tetanus had about 7,87,000 deaths. So, um, a huge number of deaths in those days. Neonatal tetanus was, was a big, big problem. And uh, in 2017, this deaths had been brought down to about 30,848 deaths. This is when we talk about worldwide. While in our country, in, uh, in um, uh, 2018, if you start looking at the figures of 2018, the total number of cases of tetanus was 4,946, and neonatal tetanus was 129. And that's all. Since it has come down tremendously after 2015, we now in say that we are uh, having an elimination of tetanus. So this is why was this so? Why the, how is this is taking place is because of uh, the three doses of D DPT which we give, and that um, it, is, it was estimated that uh, by about uh, 2015, 2015 or so, we had covered about 70 percent of the population. 27 percent of countries have reached 80 percent coverage and um, we also included the two tetanus doses in uh, pregnant women and that is how we managed to eliminate neonatal tetanus because that was transmitted to the newborn. Uh, so this is an old one according to a uh, survey in 2005 half a million children died per year in 10 countries including India. 40,000 people were, who were injured in Asia and Africa during the tsunami died of tetanus. So decline, why were the decline took place? Because um, due to the immunization coverage and uh, neonatal tetanus as I mentioned was eliminated from India in May 2015. 
India is endemic for uh, tetanus, and, and the reason, some of the reasons I told you earlier, let's tell you the further reasons which are there. One is poor hand washing practices. Fortunately, we hope that with COVID coming in and um, we're pushing the aspect of poor hand washing, a large number of disease will, will decrease in India because of good hand washing practices which have been possibly brought in by COVID. But whether these hand washing practices which are being practiced during COVID will remain afterwards is to be seen. Improper delivery practices in traditional birth. You see improper, the delivery in the villages was carried out by, by local dais. And these local dais never used to use any good practices for delivery. They were delivered in houses which were which were which had cow dung on the floors, which had um, insanitary places, and water use was insanitary. The um, cord was cut with uh, with blades which which uh, were uh, rusted, and were um, cow dung was applied on to the umbilical cords. These all were creating ideal facilities for transmission of tetanus. There was a disinterest in immunization early on. Also livestock raising, you see in many of the villages you have livestock which is there kept inside the house in the angans. You have livestock being kept. So transmission of uh, tetanus becomes even better, uh, chances of transmission become better um, because children are playing there so they get a wound. They, that can be contaminated by the cow dung itself. So it will be, be medically underserved areas. Most of India, the rural areas are underserved despite the fact that we have PHCs there. We don't have trained manpower manning these. Seasonal incidents about uh, greater than 50% of cases in India occur in July, August and September. The reason being this is the time when there is a large amount of flies and uh, so these flies are also um, one of the reasons where they can um, sit on on infected substance and then come and sit on the wounds. Um, so let's consider the agent host and environmental factors. The agent you are aware is an anaerobic gram positive spore bearing uh, bacteria. 10 serotypes all with the same exotoxin. Very very important to remember this. You have 10 serotypes of Clostridium tetani, but they produce the same toxin. So, if we have something, if we have an antitoxin, a single antitoxin will cover all the 10 serotypes. Spores in soil, dust, animal feces persist for months and years. So, in a wound, these, these spores, if they are there in a wound and the wound is closed, uh, you can have these, these uh, spores staying on for years. And suddenly you will find that the spore becomes active. Spores are very resistant and they can be destroyed under pressure at 120 degrees. Under pressure at 120 degrees for 20 minutes. So it takes a huge amount of uh, effort to kill these spores. Clostridium tetlae has been isolated from abdominal scar wounds of women operated 10 years ago. So in 10 years also the spores can remain dormant and then come to life. So these are drumstick shaped uh, clostridium tetani. You have studied this microbiology. I try to run through the microbiology portion. Soil and dust, 50% of samples will be positive for the bacillus and uh, the, in the intestines and uh, feces of cattle, horses, goats, sheep, clostridium tetani is present. Instead of man, uh, they, you do find it in, in stand of man also, especially those who are in close contact with horses, like horse breeders and people who look after horses, etc. Two types of toxins are released. One is a tetanospasmin, which causes the tet uh, tetanus, and tetanolysine, uh, which is uh, the, also the second most toxic after the botulinum toxin. You see a very, very small amount, uh, 0.00001 ml is enough to kill a rat. 0 0.1 milligram for a 70 kg man. Uh, so it can kill just 0.1 milligram is sufficient to kill a man. It acts by blocking the inhibition of uh, spinal reflexes at the motor end plates. 
at the spinal cord, at the brain, and at the sympathetic system. So there's multiple actions of this particular toxin which takes place. And um, the period of communicability, there is no period of communicability in this case. It's, we're not transmitting from person to person. It has been transmitted from uh, uh, into an infected wound from anahygienic or uh, from contaminated area. So it's not contagious. No age is immune. More common among the 5 to 40 based because mostly because they are more active. Uh, neonates, as I mentioned, neonatal tetanus is common. And um, incidence is more in males, again, possibly because the increased exposure to injury. And males, males are more sensitive to the toxin than females. A risk of the tetanus more in females, possibly because of the fact that uh, uh, puberal tetanus is there, is possible. In neonates, incidence is more in males because, possibly because of the fact that uh, once the once the once the symptoms occur, if the female child, a large number of female children are not brought to the hospital, though chances of infection are same whether it's a male child or a female child. The female child. Due to our social cultural problems which are there, a female child which is sick and which is uh, is not looked after as well as a male child. Agriculture workers are the ones who can get in, in more gardeners, soldiers. These are the people who are more proximal to the soil can get injuries. Rural more than urban, of course, bound to be, and um, people who are closer to livestock. The high risk groups which are there, young persons below 10 years or elderly above 60, intravenous drug users, especially from drug users who do not sterilize their needles, immigrants because they stay in unhygienic conditions, unregistered antenatal mothers, we have already mentioned no age is immune, immunity is provided by, if you can, you can have immunity if you take two doses of tetanus toxide. And this immunity lasts for a few years. So generally we ask you to take a booster every five years, three to five years. And um, so that we give the immunity, enough immunity to the mother, we ensure that uh, the mother is given two doses of uh, tetanus toxide. Now recently we have shifted from TT to DT. Please remember this. All pregnant ladies were earlier given two doses of TT, one during the second semester, one during the third semester, uh, trimester, sorry, trimester. But this has now been changed to give DT, diphtheria and tetanus, in not single TT. The reason is because we would like to also protect the child. You see, children, the small neonate, they were the ones which were prone to diphtheria. So, if the mother is given the diphtheria, uh, uh, I mean, we immunize her against diphtheria, she, there is a chance that uh, there are, I mean, well, the, the child will also become immune to diphtheria till the time uh, the DPT takes start taking action, that is after uh, it, the child is given DPT. Herd immunity in this particular case is not useful because it is not transmitted from person to person. The environment factors depends on the man's physical surroundings. Soil is one thing which is there. Chemicals like ionizing calcium salts, lime fertilizers. Um, these along with cow dung being used, which is there, are the cause of uh, the bacillus uh, in cultivated soils. Animal husbandry, unhygienic customs and habits, unhygienic delivery practices, these are all likely to create problems, uh, add to the problem. Unsterilized instruments to cut the umbilical cord, we already talked about that. Lack of property, uh, proper primary health care and ignorance of the infection. The modes of transmission by basically by contamination of the wounds and these wounds can be due to a pinprick, skin abrasion, puncture wounds, burns, human and animal bites, stings, Unsterile surgery, intrauterine deaths, bowel surgery, dental extraction, injections, unsterile unster division of umbilical cord, 
otitis media, compound fractures, chronic skin ulcers, eye infections and gangrenous limbs. So all the things basically involving wounds, wounds, wounds of different types. You can look at various types of wounds. So what is the pathogenesis behind this? There is a contamination of wounds with spores of Clostridium tetanae, which is common. Germination and toxin production, however, takes place only in wounds under anaerobic conditions. Please remember this. Aerobic conditions is not useful because this particular Clostridium tetanae requires anaerobic conditions. You have an anaerobic, if, if the wound gets closed, if with, with, uh, with the, uh, what's called, uh, if there's a wound, it gets infected by tetanus, uh, uh, tetanus uh, uh, by Clostridium tetanae, and the wound closes. Then there are anaerobic conditions which are formed there. You can you can have the vegetative form being formed and spores being formed. So one has to be very careful. Toxins released in the wound bind to the peripheral motor neuron terminals, enter the axon, and is transported to the nerve cell body in the brainstem and spinal cord by retrograde intraneuronal transport. So this is the this thing I'm sure microbiology has covered this in detail. I'm not going into detail. Tetanospasmin, like botulinum tox toxin, may block the neurotransmitters and release at neuromuscular junction and produce weakness or paralysis. Uh, recovery requires sprouting of new nerve terminal because it just totally gets blocked. In local tetanus, only the nerve supplying the affected muscle is involved, while general tetanus occurs when toxin is released in the wound, enters the lymphatic and the bloodstream, and then is carried to distant nerve terminals. And then the blood brain barrier blocks the direct entry into the central nervous system. So let's see what's the difference between bottle and toxin and neurotoxin. And you have a motor nerve. In bottle toxin, basically, we are looking at a, a blocking of the acetylcholine, while in tetanus toxin you are looking at blocking of the glycine. What does acetylcholine do? It releases and induces muscle contraction, while glycine re induces muscle relaxation. So, botulinum toxin will cause flaccid paralysis, while um, tetanus toxin will cause twitching. Uh, paralysis, which is uh, which is, causes twitching and various other spastic changes, which are there. So you can see the difference. It is assumed that intraneural transport are equal for all nerves. If it is assumed that way, short nerves you'll find the transmission will be faster. Short nerves are affected before long nerves. This explains the sequential involvement of the nerves of the head, trunk, and extremities in generalized tetanus. Incubation period normally 6 to 10 days could be even one day very, very, very rarely but generally can carry on for 10 years or more. Um, this is again please remember that um, the, the most common incubation period period is about 7 days and that is the reason why in Punjab etc it was called the 8 day disease. It is highly toxigenic, the, in the highly toxigenic strain and the favorable tissue environment, a large amount of toxin may be produced and absorbed rapidly so that the incubation period is short, attack is severe. Okay, which are the different types of tetanus that we know of? Traumatic tetanus, we've already talked about it, trauma, the major cause. Puperial tetanus, uh, tetanus again we've talked about it, tetanus following, uh, following um, deliveries or abortion. Tetanus neonatorium, that is of the child, that is the commonest cause of infection of the umbilical stump. Another place where you can get tetanus from is autogenic, that is where you have got um, infection of the ear, CSOM, the foreign or foreign body introduced into the ear by children. Um, these can cause autogenic tetanus. And idiopathic, maybe you can possibly not come to know what is the uh, reason for the uh, tetanus. Mildest, see different uh, types of what happens in local tetanus is it is the mildest form which causes little rigidity and spasm. 
heart muscles. Prodromal symptoms are malaise, apprehension, sore throat, mild headache. And the first symptom notice is stiffness of the jaws. Please remember the stiffness of the jaws. Whenever you see stiffness of the jaws, please start try to look for uh, ear infection, tooth infection, or then tetanus. Trismus, trismus as it is called, is that means that you have a spasm of uh, the muscles of the jaw may lead to either difficulty on chewing or make a patient unable to open his mouth. While with prophylactic antitoxin, the illness does not progress beyond the state. Rhesus saronicus, a little is beyond the trismus. The jaws remain tightly locked, and uh, then uh, the muscles of uh, around the mouth they get uh, re uh, sp into spasm, and that results in what looks like a smile. So rhesus sardonicus, which is a smile, which is sardonic smile, which is there. So this can occur. This is the rhesus sardonicus. Generalized tenseness here the whole body is involved with contractions of muscles or trunks and limbs producing acutely arched back leading to opisthotonus. In severe cases, respiratory muscles are involved, asphyxia and cyanosis. General symptoms are headache, abdominal pain or backache, difficulty in passing urine, requiring catheterization and constipation. This is opisthotonus, the arching of the back due to spasm. Doesn't occur, hope, I mean, now, I mean, nowadays we, with uh, using uh, uh, the, uh, various, uh, various treatment guidelines, we try not to have any patient with opisthotonus. Neonatal tetanus infection for the cord uh, due to unsanitary uh, habits and uh, inadequately immunized mother. Uh, baby is normal at birth, but after some time, uh, it uh, it is irritable, faces difficulty in sucking, and develops rigidity. It's possible. Prognosis is um, bad if it occurs. Onset of symptoms occur within one week, and interval between lockjaw and onset of symptoms is less than 48 hours. Eye fever and bradycardia or spasms of the larynx um, can also occur. This is another isocyanotic figure. A cephalic tetanus. Now, cephalic tetanus is the rare form of disease occasionally occurring with otitis media, in which clostridium tetanus is present in the floor of the middle ear or following injury. They have this involvement of the cranial nerves, especially of the facial area. So, this is the classification which we have Albert's classification of tetanus. A mild is mild trismus, generalized. Spasticity, no respiratory embarrassment, no spasm, no dysphagia. Moderate is moderate trismus, rigidity, short spasms, mild dysphagia, moderate respiratory involvement, respiratory rate less than greater than 30. Severe is severe trismus, generalized spasticity, prolonged spasms, respiratory rate greater than 40, severe dysphagia, and uh, apneic spells. And very severe is grade 3 with plus severe autonomic uh, disturbances, including the central nervous central system. Other complications are laryngospasm, fractures of the spine, fractures of the spine or long bones, hypertension, hospital acquired pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, aspiration pneumonia, hyperparexia and paralytic illness. These are the various complications which can occur with tetanus. Now how do you diagnose it? It's generally only clinical. Please remember this. It is basically a clinical diagnosis because what are you going to get from the wound? Are you going to isolate clostridium tetani? Very rare, very rare. 30% of cases only you get this. That also is very optimistic I think. And what do you do? You will have to demonstrate toxin uh, production in mice, which is very difficult. Electromyogram may show continuous discharge of motor units and shortening or absence of the silent interval. These things can... CSF examination is absolutely normal. Muscle enzyme levels may be raised, but there is nothing very significant which is there. So basically your diagnosis is clinical. What are the differential diagnosis? One is a purulent uh, meningitis. One has to look for purulent meningitis. Um, no sustained pattern of convulsion is seen. 
and status epilepticus um, well you look for marked mental changes which are there or tetany where you have spasms affect mainly the distal parts of the limbs not the trunk and strychnine poisoning there is complete relaxation in between the spasms in rabies spasms tend to tend to be localized no so this is how you differentiate between this and um, between tetanus and these various diseases uh the differential diagnosis for uh, this we have mentioned some of the differential diagnosis here, here um, which you have purulin meningitis status epilepticus tetany strychnine poisoning and rabies these are the most common differential diagnosis which are there and uh, the other differential diagnosis are quincy mandibular injury fracture temporomandibular joint syndrome inflammatory conditions of gums and mucosa dental problems cervical adenitis and dystonic drug reactions what is the prognosis uh, the prognosis depends on the severity of the disease in moderately severe cases with convulsions of less than 2 to 3 times in an hour illness is likely to last for about a fortnight in severe cases with convulsions occurring every few minutes then the patient is rapidly exhausted and very difficult to control uh, if it is if, it, if this convulsion is not controlled patient will die in fulminating cases with convulsions almost continuous patients develop respiratory insufficiency and are likely to die in a day or two so one has to be very aggressive in controlling the convulsions prognosis is bad in the very young especially neonates and the and, and the very old is good in the, in uh, you can have very quite go, uh, good prognosis in the young adults incubation period uh, uh, the prognosis based on the incubation period the lesser the incubation period the worse be the prognosis so if you have a very short incubation period you are looking at uh, the prognosis case fatality rate is about 40% and neonates it is high, as high as 80% uh, what do we do as far as treatment is concerned the aim of our treatment should be in the wound so that it can produce more toxin it can't produce any more and before it can reach nerve cells and to render the nerve cells less reactive to the toxin and muscles less reactive to the impulses coming from the nerve cells so basically we are two fold we're trying to handle the clostridium tetany also and trying to neutralize the toxin as well as its action on the nerve cells so you will we'll talk about general uh, this things and specific ones general as uh, stimuli of any kind may precipitate the convulsion just like in rabies we'll keep the patient in in a noise free room in preferably uh, in rabies we try and keep in a dark room but you know, here in any room which has got minimum of movement in specifics we would like to do a wound surgery antitoxins and antibiotics so what do we do we give sedatives tracheostomy and curare wherever required to control the spasms wound surgery if there is a foul contaminated wound we would like to explore the wound and uh, ensure that uh, any condition which is having anaerobic conditions which are there we remove that condition antibiotics The antibiotic of choice is penicillin, and um, so should be given as soon as possible uh, within six hours of the injury. And we prefer to give benzathione, penicillin, long-term penicillin, um, and uh, this should be one, this should be sufficient to kill um, any vegetative forms of the tetanus. For patients sensitive to penicillin, then we will give them erythromycin. Antitoxin. once that this toxin is fixed in the nerve cells you can't do anything you can't dislodge it so basically the purpose of our giving antitoxin is only to prevent further damage further damage so we will like to give an antitoxin but as soon as possible but that will not reverse whatever has taken place we will only thing is whatever is um, further damage will not take place Tetraspasm excites the nerve cells and produces convulsions. 
sedation aims at controlling these convulsions. So uh, tracheostomy ensures a free, uh, what, what we will we'll also be looking at sedation and tracheostomy. Tracheostomy ensures a free airway during spasms. In patients who have difficulty in solving <coughs> spasm or larynx, um, uh, we, we would like to do a tracheostomy. So basically what we are trying to do, we are trying to do the surgery um, to prevent the anaerobic conditions. We would like to do give antitoxin, we would like to give anti, uh, antibiotics. And to control the symptoms, we have to look at um, various various methods to control the symptoms. What to do as far as active immunization is concerned? We have, we have mentioned about tetanus toxoid. Tetanus, tetanus toxoid is basically uh, what we will use. We have got two types. One is a combined vaccine with DPT and one is a monovalent vaccine where you have got two types again. A plain or formal toxoid and an ad adsorbed toxoid. Two types of uh, toxoids. Generally we are now using DPT diphtheria, pertussis and tetanus and this is given in three doses. These three doses which are there are given at 6, 10 and 14 weeks. You give a booster uh, at 18 months and a DT without the pertussis are given at 5 years and, third, and after that another booster every 5 years is given. <coughs> Monovalent vaccines um, has long, la longer lasting immune response than uh, uh, plain toxin, the purified tetanus, which is there, but um, uh, we prefer to give DPT because again we are more keen on uh, the community care. So passive immunization, we have got both types. That is, we have got human immunoglobulin as well as anti tetanus serum. So. Uh, that the similar globulin which is there, the dose which is there, 250 to 500 units, gives a longer passive protection up to 30 days or more compared with 7 to 10 days in horse serum. Horse serum, whenever you do, remember for all cases of horse serum, wherever you do, you must do a prior test, prior um, sensitivity test before giving the serum. So if a human antitoxin is not available, equine one should be used, standard dose is 1500 injected subcutaneously. Since it's a foreign protein you would, uh, and it's rapidly increased, there may be very little antibody at the end of two weeks. ATS gives protection for about 7 to 10 days. Uh, as I mentioned, as it causes sensitivity, you must do an allergic test which is there before that. Incidence of systemic reactions are 5 to 10 percent. ATS stimulates formation of antibodies and hence a person arriving, receiving ATS for the second time rapidly eliminates it. So that is a problem which is there. ATS can be given only once. So please do not try and give, keep on giving ATS. It will not be very effective. The purpose of the antitoxin is immediate temporary protection and the purpose of the toxoid is long term protection. Now what do you do as far as prevention of neonatal tetanus is concerned? Uh, we would like to give the... Uh, you can forget about this thing about giving antitoxin etc. because we no longer have... Uh, we do no longer expect that there is any mother who is not taking tetanus uh, toxoid. So this is what we had started off on 6 EPI diseases. We will just run through it. So. Two doses for those individuals who are unimmunized. If there's if there's a lady who has a pregnant lady who has had a child within three years, then we give only a booster dose. We might like to do training of local dyes and train them, give them disposable kits, and uh, ensure that uh, they do uh, their deliveries in aseptic conditions. Also, training of the train uh, traditional birth attendants. I mean, can reduce deaths due to neonatal tetanus by up to 90%. So, as I mentioned, we give them home delivery kits, disposable home delivery kits are given to them, um, and they should 
educate against the five cleans, five cleans, five clean things, clean hands, clean delivery surface, clean cord, clean blade, clean tie and avoid application. Um, basically these are five clean, clean hands, clean delivery, clean cord, clean blade and clean tie. By clean cord we mean no application of anything on the stump. <coughs> Uh, this is not really required now because everyone is nowadays uh, immunized against uh, uh, tetanus and mothers are immunized against. If not, then you'll have to possibly give 715 transmitting to antitoxin. Whenever you have an injury, uh, which is the, the, the wound should be cleaned thoroughly with soap and water and uh, you should try and avoid anaerobic conditions. That's all that I have to say in uh, tetanus. So, this quote which was there of Grace Island, when I was born, I was so surprised, I didn't talk for a year and a half. <laughs> so, uh, protect the child, neonatal tetanus is our big concern. It has been eliminated in our country, but we need to do more, we need to eradicate tetanus from our country. And for that, we require a large amount of effort, not only in controlling neonatal tetanus, but also controlling tetanus. Providing good hygienic habits, hygiene of the wounds, very, very, very important. So all the best and we will meet you again next Monday, same time. Thank you.